I'm a very different kind of speaker. So my concept, the concept to me of being a motivational speaker, I prefer to be known as a motivational trainer. And the reason why I'm saying that is because typically in a motivational speaking, you're sitting and listening and theoretically hoping to get inspired and, and stimulate thought and walk out of here today with that. I want you to walk out of here today with a lot more than that. Uh, my hope is that as we go through this program this morning, you're going to be learning some tips, tools, and strategies that you could implement the second you walk out of here. The things that we talk about today and I train you on are not things that are just going to help you in your business, and your practice. There are things that are going to help you. There are communication approaches and strategy that will serve you in any relationship you have in your life. I decide that I am going to do what I love to do and I know it's my bread and butter. I love people. I've always loved people. I love figuring out what makes people tick. For me, figuring out how to build relationships, how to influence people, how to, be, how to excel at conversation, that to me is what life's all about. I was one payroll away from having to take out another mortgage on my house to keep that business going. By this time, I had 25 employees. All this hard work coming from the rock bottom to build this up was in jeopardy of being lost. I will tell you that in 2013, when I started Mindset Go, at 40 years old, what do I want to do with the rest of my life? And part of the reason I gave you that backstory is because when I had kids so young and was put in that situation, I didn't really get to live my 20s. So I was finally in a situation where I could make a decision on what I wanted to do instead of what I had to do. And so I decided to start Mindset Go. And Mindset Go is about what you would expect, mindset. There's a line that I use when I tell people what we do. It says, I help people develop the mindset, skill set, and tool set. But when you think about it, you might all be the most skilled people in here, and you might have all the tools to do what you do, but if the mindset isn't right, you can't do it. So let me tell you the difference between a growth and a fixed mindset. Take 30 seconds. I am very bad mechanically. I am not mechanically inclined at all. That was a fixed mindset statement. If I had said, um, I'm not great, I'm not, tech, I'm not mechanically inclined, but I'm working to be better, that's a growth mindset. And that's what I called Mindset Go. It's the concept of mindset shaping everything and go, go forward, moving forward, being positive. People typically wait to make change in a reactive way as far as a proactive way. But the problem is if there are things you can do to increase your standard of performance, it's not going to happen if you don't see a, a, a reason to do so. You know what I think is really a heck of a lot more important than drive and peak performance? Is your why. Why do you do what you do? If I sit with one of you and I'm considering doing business with you and I say, why did you get into this business? Why are you waking up every day and doing this? What's your answer? One of the ingredients to being a peak performer is going outside your comfort zone. Peak performance is starting your day with something you don't want to do, going outside your comfort zone, looking at that thing on your list that's not going to give you an immediate return and be happy because it might take you three days to complete or a week to complete, but at least you knocked out an hour or two of it. My why is because when I was in my early 20s trying to figure out my life and how to be a peak performer in all those roles, I didn't have a huge support system. So to me, every single day I live my life, and I'm being very genuine when I say this, Helping people build confidence and build skills to make them feel better about themselves, that's my way of not, so I was there, I don't want other people there, that's my why. Does that make sense to everybody? Guys, relationships are about connecting. So you don't connect by talking about what your company does. You, you don't connect by talking about the differentiating factors of the company. You connect by talking about yourself. Every single day of my life, absolutely no exaggeration, none, I think of the word differentiate. Every day. When you send an email, if you don't take time to think of your subject line, you're not differentiating yourself. 
if you waste the first two sentences with some static pleasantry, you've, you're, you're not differentiating yourself. Attention span in our society today for reading an email is nine seconds. Nine seconds. How many of you have the, the window in your email where you see your emails and you can see the window to the right of, if you click on the email, you can see that. How many of you, how many of you when you're looking at which email you're going to look at, see a super long one and go, yeah, I'll go to the next one? We all do that. Emails, LinkedIn. For those of you who take the time on LinkedIn, what's your LinkedIn template? What's your email template? What do you say when you first meet people on the phone? What do you say when you meet people at a networking event? What do you say when you're in someone's house? You have to connect as human beings. Someone says, what do you do? Right? We get that a lot. What do you do? Your answer should be for fun or work. That's what I want you to say from now on. That shifts the conversation right out of the gate where you can talk about something you're passionate about and fun. One of the things I train companies on and individuals on is something called motivational interviewing. Has anybody ever heard of what motivational interviewing is? It is something all of you would want to learn. All right? Motivational interviewing accomplishes two very critical things you need to accomplish in your life. Not even your business, your life. Two goals of motivational interviewing. It was first originated by the medical profession by doctors who were trying to get their patients to stop smoking. Right? This was it. This was the tactic they used to get patients to stop smoking. So motivational interviewing does two things. Number one, it gets people to come to conclusions on their own. You ask the right questions. It has nothing to do with like a job interview. You ask the right questions where you could literally have an interaction with a customer or prospect and never sell a thing and make the sale. It's all about asking the right questions. That's motivational interviewing. Change is so hard for people to process and understand. So that motivational interviewing element gets people, because they're coming to conclusions on their own, they then will recognize the change because it's not being forced on them. To be a peak performer, it's motivating other people to change habits, but also finding your passion and motivation to change habits. That's what it comes down to. Your goal when you interact from a communication standpoint with any other human being is to have it start with your passion, have it start with your why, and dig deep. Self-reflection gives you the opportunity to recognize what are those areas that you need to address that you're not sharp, you're not on your performance on. We make excuses because we're hoping people are empathetic to our plight. Right? People like people who are accountable, who are flawed. People like people who are flawed. The most powerful tool for peak performance, and that is self-awareness. One of the keys to habit change is building an accountability support system around you. So if all of a sudden Bud said, you know, I'm making this up, if Bud said, well, you know, I'm only making three calls a day, I want to make seven calls a day, if Bud really wants to make that happen, one of the things he would do is he would tell everybody around him to hold him accountable to check in with him. In our world, the ultimate pinnacle of communication, the single highest pinnacle of communication is initiating feedback from another human being. And one of my biggest pet peeves is the financial wealth management newsletter. I want to stick a needle in my eye when I get that. It is so, it is so impersonal. It is so industry speak. I can't stand it. Send me something that I can connect with you as a human being. And because you are all in a place where you're reaching out when you need something, reach out to show you care. Guys, outside the box. Don't be like everybody else. The way you differ is through communication. That's how you differentiate yourself. The reason why I wanted to email is to make sure I'm doing everything you want me to do to serve you as a customer. And I would love to know your feedback, anything you can do.
So when you send these emails, maybe you'll get a response like, but to tell you the truth, I'm so touched you sent this email. You've been amazing. As long as you've serviced my account, you've done everything I've asked for and then some and blah, 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 blah. Well, now you just got a testimonial out of it. Now, here's the thing about testimonials. Testimonials that say, uh, Philip's the sharpest guy around. Well, that, that's that way. We want authentic, heartfelt testimonials. Say Paul sends an email, you know, Mary, great meeting with you today. Um, you know, I know it's a big decision, blah, blah, blah. And I just wanted to send you um, some recent customers I've worked with and some of the feedback I've gotten from some longtime customers. Did that hurt? I, I mean, so the testimonials, it has to be a proactive thing, not a reactive thing. And by the way, when they give you something that you think could be an authentic testimonial, send them an email back and say, I'm so touched. Thank you so much for that feedback. Would you mind if I share this with other people? And that's it. And who's going to say no? Like, no one says no to that. But the second thing about the Patriots for me that's remarkable is, and I will say this about Bill Belichick, a very flawed human being, is he treats everybody the same. Right? This whole thing with Alex Guerrero and Tom Brady and this and that, because Belichick treats Tom Brady like he treats everybody else, and that's why they have a riff now, because Tom Brady wants to be treated differently. Bottom line is, I want you to treat everybody the same. Valued, special, connected, build a relationship. Self-perception, self-awareness, self-assessment. We're not supposed to be self-involved, but I do want you to be self-involved with those selves. Okay? If I was right now to ask every single one of you how people perceive you. It doesn't mean this is how you are. It's just how people perceive you. If you can't answer me, then you better find out. You better start asking. You better ask your colleagues, your peers, your friends and families how you're perceived. But how you're perceived is everything. It's your first interaction with a human being. And it's not just in person, it's on the phone, it's in, again, email, phone, person. If you guys have a perception that you know people might think of you, you have to address it. The elephant in the room, okay? Here's the concept of the elephant in the room. Simple analogy. 55-year-old guy I was working with who was trying to get a job. He says to me, he goes, Mark, every time I go in a job interview, they see my age and I know I'm getting discriminated against. Probably. So here's what I would tell you to do, Bob. I said, when you go in, if they're thinking it, they might be thinking it, or you're worried they're thinking it, address it. Okay? So I said, Bob, this is what I want you to do. I want to sit down and make a joke. Say, you know, I bet you're looking at my resume and seeing all that experience I have and thinking, I don't know, can this guy do what you need me to do? And just make a joke of it and call attention to it and deal with it. Because if you leave that interview and they're thinking about it, you haven't actually addressed it, you lose. So mindfulness is a word that is very threatening to professionals. And again, for the life of me, I really can't understand why, but it is. So most people, when they associate mindfulness, they think of meditation and yoga, which, God forbid, that's so terrible. But that's what they associate, okay? You know what mindfulness is? Mindfulness is a sticky note. Putting a sticky note on your desk to be mindful to do something. Mindfulness is putting a reminder in your phone to make sure you do something. How many of you do do either of those? So probably a lot more people practice mindfulness than they think. But unfortunately, someone's like, okay. So unfortunately, there's a standard of what people perceive as mindfulness. So mindfulness is about recognizing you have a habit that you want to change and do it. You don't have to change it. Catching yourself when you're doing it. Mindfulness doesn't mean you're changing the habit. To change the habit, you need to know your why and you need to be aware you're actually doing it and when you do it. Are you assessing, not by goals and quotas because they're artificial, what is your standard personally? To me, I would argue that the benchmark for a parent 
is how tight your relationship is with them. Can they tell you anything? Can they tell you everything? Will they tell you everything? Are you their go-to person? You stand out by being yourself and being human. These are things for you guys to look into. Emotional intelligence, motivational interviewing. These are fundamental concepts to learn. Storytelling. You know, people like stories. They like anecdotes. They like stories. Like, that's interesting conversation. So, that's good. So this is emotional intelligence at its best, right? So this is what I do. I have one technique I use, and I call it fooling myself. So this is what I'll do. When you start getting that feedback that could trigger you and make you defensive, I actually already have it ready to say, so I distract myself, I'll say, you know what, thank you, that was really helpful. It'll help me be a better learner, or help me be a better whatever. That's what I'm ready to say. So I almost, I'm still lack of listening. I want to hear what they have to say, but it distracts me from being triggered emotionally. And then I make a mental note of it. But it goes back to what I said about validation before. People want to have a voice and be validated. So when you, you're giving them a chance to give feedback and then by you acknowledging, and by the way, validation doesn't mean agreement. When you validate someone's feedback, it doesn't mean you agree with them. It just means you're being empathetic and validating it. So that, to me, is very important in that moment. Heavy lifting is providing resources with customers so that, or prospects so they don't go somewhere else. In a perfect world, this one-page resource you give is something that they could actually figure out answers to on the internet without actually having to actually go talk to other vendors.